This morning, we're beginning a new, brand new message series in the book of Romans. I've always wanted to preach through the book of Romans, but this is going to be kind of a light, Romans light, if you will. Uh, We're going to be looking at the nuts and bolts of Paul's letter to the Roman church. And uh, really what we're going to be looking at are the nuts and bolts or like the essential working parts of uh, Christianity, really. And so the book of Romans, and I encourage you to, to read through it, uh, maybe uh, there's 16 chapters, maybe read a chapter a day, uh, twice as we go through the sermon, sermon series, um, but I encourage you to read it because we're not going to hit everything, but in the book of Romans, you really find some of the most foundational, um, some of the most important, some of the most uh, deepest theology that you really find anywhere in the Bible. It is packed full and um, in, 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 in the book, you can find a number of, um, oh man, uh, basic truths uh, along with some advanced concepts and, of course, practical applications for Christianity. But like I said, what we're going to be doing is kind of, kind of an overview of Romans. We're going to be covering some of the highlights, and we're doing this in an effort to get not just to the heart of Romans, but to really get to the heart of the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross, his death, burial, resurrection, his, his reign, his eternal reign. And so we're also hoping that through this series, <clears throat> series that we're going to get to the heart of God, what his will is for our lives, what his purpose is for our lives. And so hopefully what we discover in this series uh, will, will inspire us with passion and that it will ignite us to, to action, to actually do something with our Christianity. And today we're going to start in the 13th chapter of Romans. <laughs> I love it. 13th chapter of Romans. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn, turn to Romans chapter 13. And uh, the reason we're starting here is because it kind of summarizes, or actually really it does summarize, our call as followers of Jesus Christ, what we're to be doing. Do you want to know what God's purpose is for you? Do you want to know what His will? Do you know what you ought to be doing? This is where we're going to start today. So the title of today's message is IOU. What does that mean? IOU, what does that mean? Yeah, there you go. You're in debt to somebody. You owe somebody something. You've got to repay something, right? It, that's exactly what it means. IOU means we're in debt to somebody. It means that we owe someone some money because they lent it to us, or maybe we owe favor because they, uh, because they did something for us, and now we owe it back to them to repay that kind of debt. But in Romans 13, Paul addresses a different kind of debt, like we need more debt, right? <laughs> in fact, the debt he's talking about is this continuing debt, this ongoing debt, or a debt that we could never fully repay. How many of you want to go in debt today? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, thanks, Paul. Now I've got even more debt to think about. But what? here's the deal. What God asks us in, uh, in return for His love that He showed to us on the cross is that we show our gratitude to Him by demonstrating and showing His love to other people. What do I mean? Well, look at Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Paul says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, we're not going to talk about finances today. All right, you can kind of get off the edge of your seat. Uh, but what I do want to say is this. That's the sermon for another time of the ro- down the road. But what I want to say is this. I have been praying for our church that every one of us would become debt-free. I mentioned that in a sermon series probably two or three years ago. And uh, that's my goal. I-, I would love to see a church. A church that's debt-free is a church that is, that is uh, generously giving, that is doing great things for the kingdom of God. And so I'm praying that for you. Uh, But we're not going to talk about today. This morning, what I want to talk about is this debt that Paul says we owe. What is the debt that we owe? To what? Love one another. To love everybody else. How do we do that? Well, look at what Paul writes next. Uh, Verse 9, the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. 
do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this, this commandment. Let's read that together. What's the commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? And then he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Do you remember the word kaka? Do you remember that in that sermon I preached a while back? That's this word. Do not wrong your neighbor. That's the word kakas. And so we're not to treat each other with kaka. I like that. All right? But it really means don't treat each other wrongly. Don't treat each other with evil, with evil intent. No kaka for each other. All right? And then Paul says, love, therefore, love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Now, why are, again, why are we starting... In this series so far into Paul's letter to the Roman church will sometimes starting with the end in mind is helpful. Starting with the end in mind is helpful, and that's what we're doing here. If you've ever taken a, a child, small children, on a, on a vacation, on a car ride, a long car ride, you know that it's not wise to talk a whole lot about, you know, uh, how long the trip is going to take, Right? Uh, you don't want to talk about how terrible it is to be crammed into this tiny little vehicle for the next 20 hours, okay? You don't talk about that. Now, what do you do? You talk about what it's going to be like when we get to Disney World. You kind of paint this picture of what you're going to do when you get there. You start with the end in mind. You paint this really beautiful picture of here's what we're going to do on vacation. And you kind of talk about that all the way to your destination. And so that's that's what we're trying to do here because when you talk about the end and, and what that looks like, it kind of gives you hope during the journey. You look forward to it. And so that's what we're doing here. We're getting the big picture so that we can kind of keep things in perspective. And we'll talk more about those little things leading up to this moment over the next few weeks, but just kind of a brief overview. So far in the book of Romans, Paul has painted this picture of... Um, he spends, a, he spends a lot of time writing about how uh, trying to, to fulfill the works of the law, trying to do what is right and obey the rules of the law in order to, to earn righteousness doesn't work. Paul spends all this time kind of laying that foundation of, man, you can, you can do all these good deeds, you can, you can give all your money, you can go out and help other people, but that's not going to earn righteousness. Or in other words, it's not going to make you good enough to get into the kingdom of heaven, to get into heaven when Christ comes back or when we pass from this earth. And so uh, Paul has talked about so far that it doesn't matter if you were a Jew growing up with the law in your life and you, you know, respecting it and obeying it, nor does it matter if you were a Gentile, a non-Jew who lived without the law as you were growing up, because here's the, here's the whole thing. When Jesus came to earth, he changed everything. When Jesus came to earth, He changed everything. Now listen, God is timeless. God is never outdated, right? He's not concerned about your spiritual heritage. And a lot of us, we take pride. Well, I grew up in the church. I was born in the church. He doesn't really care about that part of it. In fact, he doesn't care if you weren't born in the church or you didn't grow up in the church. What God cares about, what God is focused on is your present and your future. How are you living right now and how are you going to live in the future? Are you going to live for him. That's what he's, he's concerned about. He's the God of the present. And the Bible tells us that God is the great I am, not the great I was, Right? He is now, he's living, he's perfect, and, and that's what he is concerned about. And so the only thing that matters, the nuts and bolts of Christianity, really comes down to whether or not you have trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's the nuts and bolts of it. Everything else pales in comparison. When you start with the end in mind, as we're doing today, then that can help you live your life with the next in mind. How do we... How do we progress in this journey of Christianity? How do we get to love everyone? Now look at verse 8 again. He says, do not owe anyone anything except to what? Love one another. Now, while we're here on this earth, 
While we're here on this earth, that's the goal. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, that's the goal. Because Jesus loves me, and because I love Jesus, then I owe it. I'm indebted to everyone, everywhere, to love. This is what Paul is getting at here. You owe it to love everyone who isn't you. That's the verbiage he uses. That's what you've been called to do. That's whom you've been called to love. Everyone who's not you. Any person that you encounter is a person you are to love. It's not limited to your apartment complex. It's not limited to your your, uh, subdivision, your neighborhood. It's not limited to your zip code. Those are all good places to start, but those are sad places to finish because we need to love everyone everywhere. Jesus says in Matthew 22, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. We just sang about that, huh? (laughs) He says this is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Everything comes back to this. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. It's the first two L's in our vision statement, right? We, because we believe that a great, com- a, co- a great commitment to the great commandment and a great commitment to the great commission will grow a great church. Guess what, folks? We want to build a great church here in Barberton, Ohio. We're not going to do it alone. God's going to do it through us. But we've got to have a commitment to love God and love people. And to share that with everybody else who doesn't know Jesus or who has kind of walked away. And so Paul uses this metaphor as debt, this metaphor of debt as something to motivate us to love everyone everywhere that we are. And so here's what I want to do with the time that we have left here. I want to talk about three different reasons that we should love everyone everywhere. I hope you'll pay close attention because we need it so bad in our world today. We really need this. All right, so here's the first one. If you want to take notes, if you get a, got a pen, hopefully you can take some notes there. But here's the first one. We love everyone everywhere, first of all, because we owe it to God. We owe it to God. Paul says it fulfills the law. How do you love each other? Well, you, you work through the, the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and you work through those, and you don't covet, and you don't murder, and you don't commit adultery. You love each other with action. But listen to this, when Paul says that we owe this debt of love, he's not saying that unless we do certain things for God, that he's not going to love us or save us. He's not saying that. Many people, they mistakenly think that if I just do enough good deeds, if I just do enough good things, they they picture it as a scale. If my good deeds far outweigh my bad deeds, then God will let me into heaven, right? Right? But if it were even remotely possible for even just one human being to do that, to think that they can earn their way into heaven that way, then God made a tragic mistake by sending his one and only son to die for us. If just one human being could could get into heaven with good deeds, then why send Jesus Christ? That would have been a brutal thing to do, to send your only son on earth to die this horrific death if there were a way for people to make it into heaven without Jesus. And Paul sets that all up. You can't earn your way into heaven. It's not going to happen. And so uh, we, we don't owe it to God in order to earn his love. We don't owe God something because he's angry with us or because he's being unfair or because he overcharged us for something. We owe it to God because he paid everything for us. He paid everything for us. Now listen, if the old, old story has become just that, the old, old story, I want you to come with me on this journey to 2,000 years ago to a place called Calvary, and I want you to look at how Jesus hangs there on the cross suspended between heaven and earth. And and look at Jesus as as you see the blood pour down his frame. 
and drip off the tips of his toes into the dirt below. And then you've got to realize, with every ounce of blood that Jesus has poured out, he is paying for your sins. All those wrong things that you've done in your life, Jesus is paying for those on the cross. And then, so you don't miss the significance of what happens on the cross. You think about the last two phrases that Jesus utters there. He says, first of all, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He knows he's dying. It's time. And then the last phrase that he utters is, it is finished. And it doesn't mean I'm it's, it's over. It doesn't mean anything like that. And so, in English, it's three words, right? It is finished. In the Greek, it's just one. The original language is just one word, and it's tetelestai. Remember that word we talked about a while ago? Tetelestai. In Jesus' day, this is a word that, that you would uh, find at the bottom of merchants' receipts. If you went out to the marketplace, or you would purchase something, or maybe you purchased a service, the merchant would write, after the final payment had been made, he would write at the bottom of your receipt, to Tetelestai. And it means paid in full. Paid in full. There on the cross, your debt, your sin debt, was paid in full. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. To tell us die. Paid in full. And our response as followers of Jesus Christ, as his disciples, is to show our allegiance to Jesus, but to God by living for Him and loving others. We owe it. 1 John 4, 19, it's so simple. We love. Why? He first loved us. It's so, it's so beautiful. When you realize the depth of God's love for you, then your love for others can no longer remain this shallow course of action. It's deep. Here's the second one. We love everyone everywhere because we owe it to people. We owe it to people. People matter to God. Therefore, people should matter to us. And when we realize how much that we need, we, each of us, we need God's love, we know, we know we surely aren't the only ones who need God's love. And if you know that you have received the greatest gift in, in the whole world and you find out that it's available to everyone for free, who are we to hold on to that gift to ourselves? It's available to everyone, and so you owe it to people to share that gift with them. And the way, and the way to do that isn't by being the God squad in the workplace where you go and point out all the immoral flaws of the people around you, right? You don't go to your non-Christian co-workers and say, oh, you're going to hell, okay? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, what business is it of mine to judge outsiders, to ju judge those who are outside of the church? He says, don't you judge those who are inside? And then he says, God's going to judge the outsiders. It's up to him. Now, you've probably heard me say before, you know, we're not to expect the world to act like the church, right? You've heard me say that? We're not to expect the world to, to act like the church. It just can't happen. But on the other side of that, we cannot expect the church to act like the world. That's where this, these, uh, that's, that phrase comes from these two verses. As Jesus' disciples, as his disciples, we are called to hold each other accountable to encourage each other, to build each other up, to correct each other when we do something wrong or, or we sin. And so we're not called, we are not called, on the other hand, to hold non-Christians accountable. That's not our place. We can't expect the world to act like the church. And so with non-Christians, those who are not part of the church, we are to love them and we're to pray for opportunities in which we can plant seeds for the kingdom of God, which we can plant seeds in their lives so that they may begin to follow Jesus as well. 
That's what we're called to do. And it's not going to happen if we have a judgmental spirit. (laughs) It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen only when we love them, regardless of how different their beliefs may be. And so it's tough. You have to be tactful. You have to be kind-hearted. You have to be patient. And it's difficult. You can't go into work tomorrow morning and say, okay, everybody, I'm taking a poll of uh, why, why people are going to hell. Let me ask you, why are you going to hell, man? <laughs> you can't do that, all right? Um, you, instead, we are called to lovingly lead them to Jesus Christ. You don't drive them to Jesus Christ. You lead them to Jesus Christ by planting seeds, by inviting them to church, by whatever, sharing the good news with them. And, and so here's the deal. They may have different views on sexuality, on abortion, on politics. They may have different views on religion. Uh, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to approve of their behavior. We're not called to do that. But you do owe it to them to love them. Paul said in Romans 13, Love anybody, everyone, who is not you. We're called to love them. Paul knows that when we love them with the love of Jesus Christ, we have a much better chance of looking like Christ and reaching them for Christ. They will know that we are Christians by our... Love. (laughs) Yeah, actions and love, right. They will know that they are Christians by our love. And where to plant seeds, where to look for opportunities to love everyone, everywhere with the love of Jesus Christ. And the focus should be Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, it says, We proclaim Him, we proclaim Christ, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with His strength that works powerfully in me. In other words, when I focus my efforts on Jesus Christ and I share that with other people, the focus is on Him and not on me. And when we make Jesus the focus and we make love the vehicle, we have this potent combination, this powerful combination, regardless of a person's past or present, to make a difference in that person's life. It takes love, and it takes a lot of work. So, we're to love everyone everywhere because we owe it to God, we owe it to people. Here's the last one, we owe it to the world. We owe it to the world. Um, Look at verses um, 11 and 12 here. He says, besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness Put on the armor of light. The night is nearly over. Man, you got to realize the world as we know it, it's coming to an end. It's tragic. A new day is about to begin. It's not tragic for us who are Christians. (laughs) We can't wait, right? But Jesus is coming back, I mean, really soon. And perhaps nowadays, it seems like it's just right around the corner. We've got this worldwide pandemic going on. And I'm not just talking about the coronavirus pandemic. We've got a pandemic of relentless hatred in this world. Relentless hatred that people have for one another. Whites hate blacks. Blacks hate whites. Republicans hate Democrats. Democrats hate Republicans. Christians hate atheists. Atheists hate Christians. CNN hates Fox News. Fox News hates CNN. Israel hates Iran. Iran hates Israel. And I can't believe the words that I hear coming out of Christians' mouths when they say, I hate President Trump. I'm not here to defend President Trump today. Well, maybe I am a little bit. But I'm telling you, Christians, it's disgraceful when those words come out of Christians' mouths. And I want to encourage you, if those words have come out of your mouth, I hate President Trump or I hate whomever, 
I want to encourage you to go back and read the beginning of Romans chapter 13, the, the chapter that we're in today. Go back and read it because that's not what we're called to do, to hate somebody who's the leader of our country. Read Romans chapter 13. Man, we're suffering this, this pandemic of hatred in this world, and unfortunately, we Christians, we're not exempt from it. We're not exempt from it. On and on and on it goes, and maybe we've just kind of settled into our own existence, and we've kind of owned it. We've lost our sense of urgency for this world. We've kind of blended in and even embraced this pandemic of hatred, and it's just sad. Are you with me? It's sad. We can't expect Christians to act like the world, and we're doing it. I ran across uh, across a quote last week. I was studying for this message, and it said this, your evangelism, your sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ, when you're talking with other people about Jesus, your evangelism will sound like a sales pitch when your Jesus is just an idea and not a living person whom you actually know. There's a lot of truth in that. And, and our time is dwindling. It doesn't matter how old you are. You, you, you don't know if you're going to live another week. You don't know if you're going to live another 30 years. You don't know when Jesus is going to return. Uh, and so Paul calls us to this love, to love everyone everywhere because the night is almost over. He's very upfront. This world is coming to an end, and we owe it to the world to, to love them because we are running out of time. As Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be light in this dark world. To throw off the deeds of wickedness and to love. We, we're called to love the world for the sake of the world. I hope you're with me. Let's put an end to this pandemic of hatred. We can do something about that. It's kind of difficult to do something about coronavirus. <laughs> we can do something about hatred. We can just love. That's most important. You see, according to the Apostle Paul, we each have a pretty big neighborhood. <laughs> it's the world that we're called to love. It's, it's the person in the apartment complex next to you. It's, it's the barista at your coffee shop. It's the businessman on the plane next to you. If you do a lot of flying, it's the waitress who looks like she's having a rough day. It's the person who looks differently from you, who thinks differently from you, who acts differently from you, who has a whole set of different values from you. We are called to love everyone everywhere, and we're called to love everyone who is not you. At Calvary, God so loved the world, so dramatically, so completely. And at Calvary, he didn't play any favorites. This wasn't for white people or black people. This wasn't for Republicans or Democrats. This was for everybody. He loved everyone, everywhere, regardless of race, political stance, or whatever. Now, we could never pay that kind of love back to him, right? <laughs> but the beauty of grace is that Jesus doesn't ask us to pay back to him. To pay him back. He asks us to pay it forward and, and to show the love of Jesus Christ to everyone everywhere just as he showed it to us on the cross. 